Sometimes we have to see something before we can be something. Today, I'm going to share with you interviews that I've done with four top producing agents where they share what they did when they began in the business, what they did kind of in their intermediate, and how they arrived at the place they are now as a top producing agent. Typically, when I did these interviews, a lot of times what's pretty fun for me was is that it was both entertaining, it was educational, and it was inspirational to give people an understanding of some of the things that people did in the beginning that maybe you don't realize and you just see the last chapter, you don't see all those other chapters in the meantime that helped them get there. So I'm going to start actually with Heidi Harris. Great story from about Heidi on how she got started in the business, kind of how she's now grown her business into a team. Also, we're going to hear from Andrew Undham. Andrew uh, started out in general sales and then in, in some on-site sales and now he has grown one of the biggest uh, one of the biggest teams in all of the country and he does it with a very systematic approach so you're going to get some great ideas from there. Also Molly Slagle out of Houston, Texas as someone that is a single agent has grown her business to a substantial level. She's done this through a number of different ways. She talks about the practical things she does and exactly what has helped her do this. Last but not least is Brad McCallum. What I love about watching the journey of Brad is, is that he's built his business completely on video. So you're going to see that journey from starting out to where he is now where he's generating so many leads that it's hard to keep up with all of the leads that are coming in. Um, as you go through these videos, and listen, if you want to go through and you have a particular person you want to see, down below you're going to see in the agent notes an opportunity for you just to fast forward or to see in chapters how to get to that one that you want to listen to. But if you'll listen to all four of these, I'll promise you you're going to walk away with some strategies that you can apply immediately in your business. Let's get to it. All right, today I'm joined by Heidi Harris. She is the owner broker with Home Sweet Heidi Realty in Raleigh, North Carolina, also um, powered by, obviously, Berkshire Hathaway up there. And so one of the things I want to mention about this episode in specific, if you've had an excuse that you don't have an SOI, we're going to solve that problem. If you are wondering, how do I build my presence on social media? We're going to solve that problem. If you're at a place and you're wondering, how do I get put deals together when there's no inventory? Heidi's going to solve that problem. Stick with us and let's get to it. All right, Heidi. So this is really, I, I'm super excited for you to share with some of the things I told you offline that I have kind of almost been following you from afar for a long time and just <laughs> admiring the way that you um, that you really brand your business, you brand your 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 team and just everything that you do. And so if somebody doesn't know you, can you tell them a little bit about yourself, where you are and the team makeup, if you don't mind? Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. I'm Heidi Harris. I'm from Raleigh, North Carolina. We service all of the triangle. So that's like Durham, Chapel Hill, Raleigh, Wake Forest, Cary, and then probably like a hundred other cities that I'm forgetting <laughs> about. Uh, but yeah, we uh, service that area. It's We have a team of five. I'm the team leader and then we have four others and we're all really, really good friends. So like they hang out without me sometimes and it hurts my feelings, <laughs> but um, yeah, we've got a really cool team dynamic. We're all high energy. We all really love our clients. We believe in doing the right thing and we believe in making a lot of money and having a good time while doing it. Yeah. Um, and I think that it sets us apart in our industry. Yeah. Um, we do a lot on social media. We do a lot for our, our listings. So everything that we're doing, we're just like putting out so much love and yeah. then naturally we're getting love back, which has been really. Yeah, different. it is. I, I, I'm excited to share with everybody a little bit about, you know, the amount of business average sales price, if you don't mind that kind of things. Yeah. And also where you, when you started in the business, how long you've been in the business. Okay, great. So I've been in the business since 2012 mm -hmm. and I was a solo agent for, more than half of that. Um, and our average, gosh, I did this a couple months ago. I think that our average price is like 325, 350 yeah. mm -hmm. in Wake County, which is the main county that we serve. It's 306 is the average. So we're just like a, a smidge above that. Yeah. Um, and last year we helped over a hundred families and I think we did like 37 million or 36 awesome. million or something like that. Oh, that's awesome. Incredible. Yeah. 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 Um, and so let's go back to when you started. So what got you into real estate? How did, how did that originally start? I'm going to be honest with you, Jimmy. So <laughs> I hope so. I know. <laughs> yeah. My husband was right. Okay. I have to lead with that because I, no, I hate it when he's right. Okay. <laughs> and um, I was working, I was selling radio ads. And so I was literally selling air mm -hmm. and hoping that it worked. Yeah. And it's a very turn and burn job. I did it for seven years. I'd come home crying and I'm not an emotional person at all. I was just drained. Yeah. And um, 
one night I was crying in bed and my husband was like, why don't you get your real estate license? And I got so mad at him. It's like, how dare you say that to me? That is so mean. I don't like realtors. You know, they're all used car salesmen. This is, you know, why would you even think to say that to me? And I remember turning around and just like crying into my pillow. And then I woke up the next day and I was like, I can be different. Mm. I can make money because I can switch the perception of what people think about realtors and actually service my clients and care about them and love them. When we bought the house that I was crying in, (laughs) Mm -hmm. um, our realtor called us one night and said, Hey, the appraisal came in low. And we're like, Oh, so what do we do next? And she's like, I don't know. We'll figure it out. And she hung up the phone Mm -hmm. and we didn't get hold of her for 48 hours. And it was just like, so to me, that's what realtors were was like, Hey, I'm just going to do the bare minimum. Right. We'll let you figure it out. And so I came in here with a chip on my shoulder Mm -hmm. and also (laughs) nobody to sell to, um, I'm originally from a small town in Maryland called Westminster, Maryland. And I came down to North Carolina. I went to college at Barton College, which is a small college. And that's where I met my husband. I followed him here to Raleigh. He has like eight close friends. So that was my sphere of influence. Mm. It was like Mm -hmm. that. And then like maybe a couple coworkers. So, um, but I didn't think about it. Nobody told me, I I should have known. Like I take full responsibility, <laughs> but nobody told me like, Hey, do you have 50 people that might support you or, you know, whatever the rule is, I'm sure it's out there somewhere. Mm-hmm. Um, so I went in it like, just like blind bravery. And, um, I wrote notes to people and I was like, Hey, th- just want to let you know, this is what I'm doing. I got my real estate license. If you know anybody that can help, I'd love to help. Here's a business card. Um, you know, I saw on Facebook that your daughter got engaged. Congratulations. Or like, just like something. Um, making it a little personal, but then also something about me. I did that. And then I wrote um, notes to other realtors in other areas. So I'm in Raleigh. Charlotte is another big city. Mm -hmm. And so I went to Charlotte's websites of their top real estate companies. And I saw who the top producers were. And I wrote them letters. And on the front, I wish I had it. I'm going to use it. On the front, it said, I love paying referral fees. And then you'd open it and it was, Hey, my name's Heidi Harris. I'm based in the triangle. If you ever have anybody moving that way, let me know. I'd love to pay your referral fee. Hope you have a great day. And I included two of my business cards. Mm -hmm. Still today, I'm getting referrals from those people. Um, It cost me a postage stamp. Um, My sphere of influence supported me immediately. I got in, gosh, what year, how old was I? I don't know. I guess I was like 27 mm-hmm. when I got it. Um, and so people were like just buying their first houses and stuff. Yeah. So I think I, I was beginning to miss that first wave of people buying their first houses, but I caught the tail end and now people are buying their second houses, you know, starting their family, stuff like that. Um, but doing those things in the beginning. Yeah. It yeah see, set it, a different tone. This is what's awesome. I mean, a lot of people, um, you know, what I love is, is that a lot of people will use any excuse they can find. Well, I just don't know anybody here. I don't have a sphere of influence, but that was not what you did. I want to go back to this and talk about this from a standpoint, because this is such a great idea. Every single market in America has a feeder market. Um, Some have multiple and some like us in the coast. I mean, these are people coming from everywhere into our market right now. So let's talk about that specifically. So let's really get tactical on this. So you went to the website. Let's start from, okay, I'm identifying Charlotte. Now, what was the next step? Okay, so the company that I used to work for was Allen T. Realtors. So immediately I went to the Allen T. Realtors in Charlotte. Um, I started in January. So the, the list of top producers had just come out. So I found it on the website, boom, top producers. And then I went to Berkshire Hathaway boom, top producers, Keller Williams, boom, top producers. The finding them was not hard. Right. It was just trying to Google it. And look, if you can't find where the top producers are, or maybe you're watching this and it's not January, send it to anybody. Because just because you're, I mean, you could be a top producer and just be so overwhelmed that you get a piece of mail and you're like, that's cute. And you throw it away. Right. You you, all you need is a call. So it can be anyway, if you just want to go drill an office and just do it. I mean, it's the, it's a postage stamp. That is all it costs. Yeah. So what and was the first one? What did that first one look like? And you were like, wait a minute. I think I got something here. When was the first? I mean, you got to remember some of these. Oh, no. Th- this story, you're going to think I made it up. 
So I am, um, there's a super successful realtor in town. His office was right next to my office. And I went in there defeated. Mm. Once again, I was crying. The person that doesn't cry was crying. <laughs> and I was like, hey, Van, um, how, how do you stay in this business? He was like, well, what do you mean? I was like, I'm putting out so much energy. I'm not sleeping. I'm missing meals. I am hustling. I am working so hard and I don't have a commission check. Everything that I'm doing today isn't going to pay off for like years. What do I do? And he was like, exactly what you are doing. Like, this is what it's supposed to be like. This is what you're going to look back on one day and be like, this is the soil that like brought all of this produce out. He was like, exactly what you're doing right now is what most people don't do, which is why only what? 13% of realtors, right. of realtors make it. Um, so he was like, remember this moment as painful as it is, remember it. And mm -hmm. when you feel big, remember it. When you feel little, remember it. And it's going to go far for you. And I was, now I think about it and I kind of get goosebumps because I'm like, dang, you know, what a magical moment. But in that moment, I was like, I just want you to feel bad for me. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Um, but he knew because he knew it because he had done it. Um, so anyway, so that happened the next day, Jimmy. I got a phone call mm. and it was somebody that I wrote a letter to the referral letter. Hey, I still remember it. Hey, my name's Tony. You sent me a card saying that you work in Raleigh. I've got a buddy. I just sold his house. It just went under contract this morning. He's going to be moving to an air uh, city right outside of Raleigh called Clayton. Here's the thing. He needs to look at houses tomorrow. I'm sure you're busy. Do you have time? I know. Yes. Let me see if I can organize my busy schedule of complaining. Right. And so I was like, Ooh, let me see what I can do. Uh -huh. And I showed him, I showed this guy one house. He bought it for cash. He closed in two weeks. Come on. It was my first closing I had. It was super easy. It was new construction. So there wasn't really too much right. to yell about. Um, it, uh. it validated that what I was doing finally worked. How many do you think you sent out total that first year? Probably not enough. Um, yep. Because when I did it, you know, you're kind of hoping for immediate response. Right. You got to think when I sent it out, I sent that out in, in January. My first closing was in July. Yeah. yeah. So I probably sold it, sent out 50. That's it. Yeah, I did not. Yeah. Um, but I have still today, probably seven or eight of these people that we constantly pass stuff back and forth to. Um, oh. from that. And, and the, my very first closing, they just bought and sold a couple months ago. So it was like totally full circle. And it was yes. amazing. Yeah. It's so <laughs> I'll say this. What would this have looked like if you'd done 500? You know what I mean? That's the thing we always, because we just don't think about it when we're doing it. We want to wait for results. But if you understand, so somebody that's listening to this right now, that's sitting there going, oh, I, you know, how did 50? She got one. Let me just say this. If you had done, I mean, why would you not? As long as you understand that it works, you know, that's what we all do in our own business. But that's the beauty of like this. And this is why I appreciate you coming on so much, because now you're sharing something with somebody that I'll promise you somebody's going to text you in the next couple months or email you. And they're going to say, Heidi, I listened to that. And I got my, I can't thank you enough. That's the value of of us being, you know, helping each other so much in this business. I pray that you're right because Jimmy, I've told this story to so many people. I've never had one person say that they did it. So my challenge to whoever's watching this right now mm -hmm. is I challenge you to text me and give me your, um, your success story. It will, right. it will work. People, uh, how many times do you just get online and you're like, Oh, I need a realtor in Charleston, South Carolina. You're just Googling somebody mm -hmm. like instead be proactive, send them your business card. I want to make sure that they make that a two person included on that text. Also, I want to be on that too. Um, Cause I'm going to ride your, I'm going to ride your wave a little bit. So I appreciate this. So, so listen, <laughs> let's go back a little bit because listen, if you don't have an SOI, you've got to build your brand or you've got to build it where people begin to know you. Um, I, I know from your background, but talk a little bit about your background in college that prepared you and what you did with that to start working on social media to build that brand. All right. So um, I wish I knew that you're going to ask me this question. I have a news article from my uh, college newspaper. So my college town newspaper, and it's me in my dorm room and it's me being on Facebook and MySpace. And I was so cool because I had both. And it was like, the future is here. And it was me on social media. Um, so, I mean, I started out just having a page because I was in college. It was a cool thing to do. 
Um, but again, I had eight people in my sphere of influence. Um, I was writing letters to strangers. I was freaking out. Um, and I just got on social media. I started a home sweet Heidi. That's the name of my team. Home sweet yeah. Heidi Facebook page. Um, I later started an Instagram page once that came around. Um, LinkedIn has been amazing. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, but what I do is I just update people, people, people like real estate. That's mm-hmm. why Bravo and HGTV work with all these like real estate shows. It's interesting to people. Mm-hmm. And so I just, I'm just myself on it. Um, but I, I post at least twice a week. Yeah. Um, it's important people. You need to be top of mind. The moment that somebody thinks I want to buy a house, I want them to think Heidi. That's right. So, um, but yeah, so really just college, it was just feet in the water, doing it for fun. Yeah. And now it's business. And last year we closed 30% of our business was closed from social media. Mm. And I'm not talking about like, you know, my buddy who I also know from somewhere else. I'm talking about strangers, people that don't know us from social media, reaching out to us, hiring us. And look, the cool thing about social media is people think that they know me Mm -hmm. because they see me. Right. When I go in, I'm not being interviewed. Mm -hmm. People aren't asking weird questions like, well, how often do you get fired? You know, like, like this person's like, well, I don't know. Are you going to fire me? (laughs) What's happening? Um, I have the job. If they call me, I have the job because they automatically trust me because I'm myself. Um, I keep in touch with them often, even though they're following me. Um, But it is, I'm excited to see what 2021 is going to bring with our social media. If we did that, because the year before we did 20%. Mm. Mm. Last year we did 30%. So can we do 40% this year? Hey, so this is what's cool. So how did, I mean, how did you get started? What did that look like when you started to build your audience? Um, Was it just the consistency or were there certain things you did to build the audience? Oh, I got started so rocky. Um, I mean, I was really just Googling the word home or like, houses with a red door, (laughs) but just like make posts and I'd get like three likes. I didn't know what I was doing, but I was doing it. Mm -hmm. And so little by little, none of this is overnight. None of this is, you know, I don't have a rich daddy, you know, Mm -hmm. I didn't used to do this as a job. I just did it and I figured it out. Um, blood, sweat, and tequila, (laughs) um, but it, uh, social media has been really cool because I've met a lot of friends on it. Um, I've met a lot of realtors locally that now what they do is when they list a house, they tag me in it because they hope that they have my buyer. Uh, so it's been a really amazing evolution there, but it's really raised, Mm. raised our trust level, I guess is the right way to say, I don't really know. It it absolutely does. It helps people move. You know, if we're in the no like trust business, they get to know you initially when on there, they begin to all of a sudden they're like, well, I really like Heidi. I mean, she's got, I mean, this is, she's got our energy. This is what we like. And then all of a sudden it moves to the trust because they start seeing you having success with other clients. I've seen some of your posts where you've got, where it's talking about those people and how you help them, how it's talking and telling the story of those folks. And so all of a sudden now, the second they come to you, yeah, they feel like they know you because they've walked with you through listings. They've walked with you through transactions. They've met your friends that, that, that were your clients have now become friends that can't, that are just gushing over you and the whole team. So it's absolutely that way. You brought up a good point though. This is something I always tell people. I had an agent sitting across from me yesterday that said, and I was like, you will kill on Instagram right now. You should be doing, and this is not, you know, and so, uh, I don't want to go through the shame of only having a couple people like something about post it. I said, it happens for everybody. You don't get to a thousand likes or a hundred likes or 50 likes without those first one or two that yep, you do. Right. They're going to be that way. You're right. And I'm pulling up my Instagram right now because we started on Instagram way too late. It was, I, I can't believe we didn't do it sooner. Um, but I want to see what my first post was because it wasn't good. And I bet I got like three likes, but I don't care about likes. Right. I care about being seen. And if anybody's like my husband, he will go on and, and doesn't like anything because um, he's just scrolling. So I don't really care about likes. I care about business. And yeah. so if it's reaching out to me, I'm doing something right. Um, but yeah, our our social media, we originally started it as like, it's Raleigh and it's the weekend. What's going on? Mm-hmm. Not so much about houses. And then right. full circle. It, yes. <laughs> no, it's all about real estate. 
Yeah. Let me ask you this also, because obviously, you know, this comes down to um, y'all do some really great stuff as far as um, video, as far as visually with photos. Um, you know, nobody starts at that level. How did that start? And what does it evolve to now as far as visually? Your stuff is just stunning. I mean, so what, what did it, how did it start? And now what does it look like? Uh, thank you. So when I was in college, funny story, I went, I used to date a guy that was deaf in high school. And so I just got really big into the deaf community, which is maybe why I talk with my hands so much. Mm -hmm. um, so I went to this specific college because it had a major for the deaf and hard of hearing. And I was like being a teacher and I was like, oh, great. This is, this is what I know. This is what I'll do. I get there and I, I'm in it for, I'm in the program for a year and a half. My college advisor, I guess that's who it is, who like helps you pick out your classes. She makes a joke to me and she says, Heidi, I'm surprised this is what you want to do with your major because you talk a lot. And I laughed and I was like, <laughs> funny, you're funny. And I got back to my dorm room and I felt like somebody punched me in the gut. Mm. I was completely breathless. And I was like, I've been here for a year and a half and I'm mm. studying something I don't want to do. Right. Mm. So this is coming from a place of failure, right. just like my real estate story. Um, and I went to the admissions department or wherever you're changing your major. I don't know what it's called. And I was like, hey, uh, I'm Heidi. Uh, can I please change my major? And they're like, sure, what do you want? And I was like, well, do you have a list? Like I had no thought here, okay? This is blind faith. And um, I looked at the stuff and I was like, well, communications, okay, cool. Uh, journalism, my aunt's a journalist, that could be cool, great. Uh, video broadcasting, all right, cool. And I turn it into the lady and she goes, oh, you wanna be a news anchor? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> That's exactly <laughs> yeah, what I want. Thanks for asking. I certainly do. So um, I ended up double majoring in journalism and video broadcast production, which gave me a really great platform to practice on. And so video is very easy for me. I'm very comfortable in front of the camera. Um, so when it came to real estate, why not use your strengths, right? Like I know, I know what my strengths are. I know what my weaknesses are. Right. And so being on video, I try to do that at least twice a week. Um, but we were really blessed. One of our dear friends reached out to us and said, Hey, I've got somebody. She's a videographer. She's up and coming. Do you want to hire her for a project? And I was like, sure. Yeah. So she reached out to me. She's like, look, I'm just trying to pull, uh, build my portfolio. I'll do the first one for you for a couple hundred bucks. Let's just see if we like each other. And I was like, perfect. Well, Jimmy, I ended up hiring her last month. She's now on the Home Sweet Heidi payroll. Um, she is outstanding and she's brilliant and she elevates us. Mm -hmm. And I believe that I am my product. Mm -hmm. So if I look that good for a bit, not I look that good, but the videos look that good, you better believe how good I'm negotiating. You better believe how good I'm servicing my clients. Everything matters. Yes. You, know how you don't go to a client's house wearing sweatpants, right? Like you go and you show up. And every time that I am putting anything out there, I want it to be done with class and I want it to be done with like the highest amount of um, quality. Yeah. Also, mm -hmm. people rarely, rarely question how much I charge mm -hmm. because they see what I put out. Mm -hmm. So they don't really care as much about. Absolutely. I know, you know, and, and we were out to give some other people some ideas. I mean, we both got the mutual friend, Kristen um, Nelson, that she just uses her iPhone, you know, and she always has, and it's, and it's, she's being her. You yeah. have to play to your strength. That's her personality just comes through. It doesn't matter if she's got an iPhone or whatever. Yeah. You and I, I've got, we've got a videographer. What yeah. we've done and the way we started for those people that are trying to figure it out is I would just say, take action, but yeah. just do just it. Like you, we went and found um, a, we actually did an internship program over a summer where we went to closest school to us, major college, um, which was Florida State University. We found two people that were very good at videography, brought them in. They got an internship with Berkshire Hathaway on their resume and they got at $10 an hour, we get enough content shooting that and they got to live at the beach i mean they, who didn't want that you know oh. and so they they literally we shot in we just shot things we ended up hiring one of them as a videographer when he graduated we've also now got one that is working with us that's we bumped it up we're paying a full to 15 dollars an hour you know for somebody that's extremely talented you know yeah. and and he wants to learn how to do real estate so he's learning how to do real estate while he's adding value to us yep. and it's a two-way street. Um, the undervalued thing also is every single high school and middle school right now has a morning show 
where kids have learned how to use cameras and video. It doesn't have to be grand. Those kids are looking for community service. They're looking for summer jobs. They're yes. looking for all these things. I'm, it's, it's, it's out there to do. Um, I just, I'm like you, just, just do it. That's where the value and what you're talking about. Where are people understanding who you are and already know you? It's through the video. Sure. And I do 95% of my stuff on my iPhone. Yeah. So um, I've got a tripod here. I have a tripod in my car. So in case if I'm out somewhere and I want to do it real quick, I mean, what is that? 20 bucks off yeah. Amazon? Yeah. Put it on your wish list, ask for it for a birthday present, whatever. Um, that it's to not do, I can't understand why you wouldn't want to do it. Some people don't like to look at themselves on video. Mm -hmm. I get it. Mm -hmm. And for that, what I say is practice doesn't make perfect. Practice makes you comfortable. That's right. Just try it. Just do it. The worst thing that happens is you don't watch your video for a second time. Mm -hmm. Like maybe you just publish it, but you yeah. know what? You're getting eyes on you and those eyes, if they weren't on you, they'd be calling somebody else. Right. So that's where you get to have a heart to heart with yourself of like, how much do I want to succeed? Mm -hmm. And if video isn't your thing, then maybe you take really beautiful pictures or like maybe you're an amazing storyteller and you can do a beautiful blog series. Whatever you want to do, just lean into your strengths because there's enough business out there that if you're just sitting there and complaining, it's. We're, we live in such an abundant situation. I, I tell everybody, they don't, I've been doing this, you know, because I'm the old guy, I guess now. I've been doing this 27 years. Over half of my life, I've been in real estate. I've never been more excited about the opportunities that are there for people that will take action in real estate right now. You know what I, I really appreciate about that you and the, the entire team does also is some of these unique things, things that kind of set you apart, do a little different. Let's talk about some of that marketing, some of the things everybody's looking for listings now. What are y'all doing to take advantage of these listings that are selling so fast, which it's great they're selling so fast, but it's also bad they're selling so fast because then we don't have inventory. What are you guys doing? Uh, first of all, I don't think that Joe Public knows that houses are selling so fast and it's because we don't have enough. Right. Mm -hmm. So tell them, right? <laughs> like that's our job. We need to tell them because right now we're filming this in January. Um, traditionally in my area, a slow time. Mm -hmm. It is not slow. It is no. real estate right now. Mm -hmm. So most people don't know that. So most people are gearing up for the spring. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what? All the listings that are gearing up for the spring, so are the buyers. Yes. So why don't you get out there now so that you're not competing against 20 other offers. You're just competing against seven. Mm -hmm. um, so again, that's what we're doing on our team. The way that we have it, I don't know if you know what a gecko board is, but it's a mm -hmm. TV and it's got, you know, stuff listed. So this is ours. Ooh, over there. Um, but we have all the houses that we're marketing soon mm -hmm. and also all of our buyers on there. So we get to play matchmaker mm -hmm. in 2020. We had a beautiful, um, opportunity. Gosh, I don't know how many times to just match before they even hit the market. Right. And the success that we got from that was amazing. Everybody was happy. We did a really great job with it. Um, so that's always fun and unique. Um, but even when I'm talking to buyers or sellers, I make sure I mention that because if they're hiring somebody else that isn't doing that, that's it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a great way for somebody to select you is to kind of lead with that doubt. Like, you know, what's special about working with the home sweet Heidi team is you get first dibs on our listings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, but also, um, again, back to social media, because that's, yeah. That's me part. Um, yeah. I've got other realtors that just slide in my DMs and they say, Hey, Heidi, you know, I'm looking for this. What do you have? Yeah. And, and then that gives me the opportunity to say, Hey guys, there's a buyer looking for this. Who knows somebody that's selling a house exactly. that looks like this. Exactly. It's just, yeah. we're just asking for opportunities. Yeah. I, I will say this too, Heidi. I, we were, I went over this yesterday in our market, our inventory, every single week, it continues to get smaller and smaller as far as the homes that are for sale. But when we look and we do a deep dive on the market, in actuality, the transaction numbers are still going up and they're still, you know, so you would think, oh, well, there's less houses to sell. Transaction numbers have to come down. But here's what's happening is, is people like you, the good agents are putting deals together before they actually even hit the MLS. So the inventory continues to do that. In reality, for the good agents, the agents that are willing to make the calls, be the matchmaker, really find that, turn some stones over. When somebody says they want to live in that neighborhood, start calling people in that neighborhood. Yes, yes. yes. All of a sudden now, what's happening yes. is, 
is this is the opportunity of a lifetime for great agents to shine like never before for our clients where you are different, you know? So Heidi, one of the things I love is, is that obviously things are not staying on the market long and that gives us less time to expose our, or give ourselves an opportunity to market ourselves with a listing. So how are you overcoming that? Because obviously when we have these times where it's like, it's an object, it's something we're having to overcome. It does create opportunity. What are you guys doing? So we are trying to, you said the word opportunity, any yeah. opportunity we can have to grab eyes and listings, we're after it. So I got these signs made. Oh, it's so good. And notice it's only one. There's not, we used to have two because like back in the day, remember when houses would be on the, on the uh, market for more than nine days. Um, so anyway, we got these and it's, we got our home sweet Heidi logo right there. We put that right in the yard next to, um, well, we used to put sold signs up. Instead, now what we do is we have our riders that have our info. This is now our sold sign That's because great. this gets so much attention. People call us. My friends will text pictures of it. Um, actually, we did a giveaway a couple months ago where if you saw one of those, you'd get a Keurig machine. Um, uh, and people are just like doing selfies next to them. Um, and they're hot pink, which is our color. So it really stands out. But when people see that, it grabs attention and we get neighbors that call us and say, Hey, I saw it sold in two days. You know, did you underprice it? Mm -hmm. It's like, well, actually, no, we pushed the pricing, but we got this and they waived appraisal and blah, 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 blah. Oh, well, that's interesting. And then that's my opportunity to say, you know, we'd love to talk to you if you're interested in selling, or even if you're not interested in selling, can I just give you an update on how much your home is worth? Right. right. The opportunities are out there. You just have to go the extra mile to grab them. Yeah. Yeah. So great. So I love the fact we do it, um, you know, not as technical as you do, but we will have our board and we call it our next 10. It's our next 10 listings, our next 10 buyers. And then we have on the other is, is our 10 biggest referral sources. We try to keep it like you're doing in front of us at all times so that we have the opportunity where those people stay top of mind. And we want to make sure that we've touched each of them in some way, shape or form at least every couple, three days, if these are our hottest prospects that are ready to do something. So I love what you're doing there and organizing that. Listen, there was a point where you had to get to a point where you're like, you know what, I can't do this on my own, or maybe my my dream is bigger than just me. How did you decide to, to, um, to move into a team situation? And what was that first hire you made in the team situation? Oh, my first hire. All right. So I have a five and a three-year-old, as you know. Uh, when I had my five-year-old, I just referred out everything. I don't know. I didn't have anybody to tell me not to do right. that. Mm -hmm. um, with my three-year-old, when I was pregnant with her, I reached out to my broker in charge and I said, hey, you know, I want to have somebody that can support me when I'm on maternity leave or whatever we want to call it in real estate. And uh, she was like, well, look, we've got this new gal. She just started. She doesn't really know much, but she's got her license. I was like, great, cool. She came in, I interviewed her. I offered her the job on the spot. Mm. Why? My gut told me to. Mm. And mm. I was like, you know, I'm going to pay you hourly. And, you know, I just need you as an assistant. And she said, can I ask you a question? I said, sure. What's up? She said, can I be on the team? Mm. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. So five minutes, like loose leaf paper. Like, okay, Renee Shank is on the Home Sweet Heidi team, right? Yeah. And uh, now she's been with me for four years. Awesome. She's been a full-time realtor and my assistant. And she's always sold like four or five homes a year. Last year, she sold 12 homes. Next year, she's going to sell 20. Come so on. it's just like, or this year, she's going to sell 20. So it's just like, it, it came out of, hey, I'm going to have a baby. This is what I've got to do. Even if I wasn't having a baby, would I have delayed starting the team? Sure, a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but I had my second team hire three months after I hired Renee. And it just was a forward momentum. And it was mine to lose. Mm -hmm. So I just had to go after it and get it. Um, if anybody out here is thinking about starting a team and like, well, yeah, but am I ready? Am I not? One, make sure you have the right person. Mm -hmm. And two, believe in yourself. Because the only thing that's in your head right now is doubt. And if you, if your clients love you, if you're doing the right thing, you've got stuff coming in, maybe you're not giving that person leads. Yeah, That's yeah. okay. Not all teams are lead based. I give my, my team some leads, but I'm also teaching them how to fish and like, Hey, this is what mm -hmm. I'm doing. You should do this too. Um, so maybe you can be a mentor for somebody that's on your team, but you have to value yourself. And um, yeah, that was four years ago. And now we have five team members and it's, it's bigger, it's bigger than the transactions. It's, it's the it's relationship. 
I mean, th this is the beauty I think some people don't realize too, is, is somebody poured into you. The, the best way to honor that is to pour into somebody else. I believe it's the natural progression. Now we've got some agents that are with us that our average sales price is so high that they have a, an assistant and it's them and their volume is so high. But the typical person that is in a situation where they have been poured into all that knowledge you've gotten, all those times that you had that doubt and you overcame it, all those rough transactions, that doesn't need to go to waste. And the best way you can help with that is, is to pour into somebody else. And I'll tell you, because I know your heart and I know where I'm coming from, why I love doing this kind of thing is, is that somebody did this for us. I mean, the, this is, the, the, it is just, it is in our human nature. We want to help other people. And this is a way through a team for you to pour into people out of the overflow of what everybody poured into you, which is such a beautiful picture. So it's perfect. And now I'm on the National Rethink Council. Yes. And so yeah. that is for people that don't know. I mean, do you want to talk about it or do you? Want to yes, please go into it. It's so powerful. It Powerful is the perfect word. So I got the golden ticket. And what I mean by that is I went to the explosion conference in 2019. I went because my broker in charge said, hey, Heidi, you should go. And I was like, cool. I listened to everything he says. So I booked a ticket. I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't know a soul. Um, I walk in. I mean, do you know, you know, Andy Blake. Yes. Mm -hmm. Me and Andy Blake, we become buds right off the stop, the beginning. So um, he's telling me, he, we're just talking and throwing around ideas. He was like, oh, you should be on the Rethink Council. And I was like, I don't know what that is. Um, so he was explaining it to me. He was like, look, it's, it's top producers across the nation. They're millennials. They're out there hustling. They're making it happen. And it's bringing those folks together and having a mastermind. Mm -hmm. And I was like, how do I, how do, I do that? <laughs> Because, I mean, for me, I never had a friend in real estate because all my real estate friends were my competitors locally. Mm -hmm. So now I could ask somebody else, hey, I'm doing this. I, it's not working. What do you think? Um, so anyway, I got the golden ticket, as I call it. And I started on the National Rethink Council last year. So January of 2020. Um, we've had one meeting so far because everything else got shut down. Um, but these people are my dear friends. We went through quarantine via zoom and text chain. Um, they are a wealth of knowledge. They have poured so much into me and inspired me in so many ways. And it's really just swapping ideas of what's working in different markets. Um, so for those people watching in Florida, if you see something on my social media and you want to steal it, please do. Cause yeah. maybe I stole it from somebody else who knows. Um, but it's, I just feel like we're all better together. And having that powerful mastermind has been such a blessing in my life. And I'm so grateful for them. I will never be the same mm -hmm. as before. Yeah. And I'll, I'll say this. A lot of people, Heidi, they'll, they'll say, well, gosh, I wish I had that, but I don't have access to that. I will tell you from experience, because I didn't have that opportunity when I was, and I actually went out and created it myself. So listen, if you're going to at some point, we're going back to conferences, right? Good gosh. I mean, uh, you know, and I'm going to be at every one of them when they start. Every one of them. I mean, get there a day early. I'm staying a day late. <laughs> That's, right. That's right. I know. And so listen, use those times. Just like what you said, you met someone. Build your own network. Um, you can do it now with Zoom. Literally, I'll promise you, if you'll reach out to agents that are on the rise, if you're on the rise, for instance, or that is a top producer and you're a top producer and you said, listen, I got about seven or eight of us. I want us to just to talk about what's going on with listings. Could you jump on a Zoom call? You can create this so fast. People are begging you to do this. And let me say this, the best way to know what it and the get the value out of it is host the party. I mean, parties are fun, but let me just tell you something. If you host the party, it's even better. I would highly encourage if they don't have access to this to really lean on that. Listen, Heidi, this has been tremendous. You have dropped so many great things for people. I mean, literally, they're going to walk away from this with actionable ideas. And so I really want to, I want to thank you for that. How do people get in touch with you? How do they find you on social media to connect with you? If they've got a referral that they need to send up that way, how do they do that? Send me all of your referrals. I love paying referral fees, remember? Um, so I am on Facebook. It's at Home Sweet Heidi. On Instagram, it's at Home Sweet Heidi. My full name is Heidi Harris. So if you want to just friend me on any of those accounts, that's cool too. Uh, but my email address is Heidi, H-E-I-D-I, at homesweetheidi.com. And my phone number is 919-946-3292. And we'll take awesome care of your clients. <laughs> you will. I know you will. If you haven't had a chance, I would highly encourage you. Follow Heidi. She's doing it the right way. Literally, she just gave you permission to copy and just basically rip and duplicate what she's doing. So I would highly encourage it. Take care, guys, and we'll talk to you soon.
So maybe you can't relate to 499 transactions in one year like my man Andrew Undum did last year, but I'll tell you what they can relate to, Andrew. Every single person started somewhere. And what I wanna do today is, is we're gonna go through and we're gonna talk about the foundational things, maybe three or four, that you did when you started that helped put the momentum in your business that's led to all the success. This is one you're not gonna wanna miss. All right, Andrew, you know you're my boy. This is what I love doing though. I love coming in here and actually spending some time. By the way, y'all, we were trying to get Ryan Serhant. We couldn't get him. <laughs> we got the, uh, the Walmart version. That's right. Right. That's, That's what I'm known on TikTok as. <laughs> Discount Ryan Serhan coming at you. <laughs> Nobody looks more like him than you. So, but what we're going to do today and what I'm really excited about is, is most people can't relate to some of the successes that they see with the large teams. I can remember when I was first starting out, I was like, you know what? I don't know that I can relate to somebody that's doing that amount of business. So what we want to do is we want to go back and say, what were the things you did foundationally? Because I don't care if somebody's brand new in the business. I don't care if they're at a place they've been in it 10 years and they want to take it to the next level. Right. There's some foundational things you did when you started yeah. that'll really carry over to really just take that momentum to the next level. Let's start with a few things. You get into the business, what's the first thing you want to do and that you did? The first thing I did, and this wasn't that long ago, and I want to tell everyone, you should have an unrealistic expectation of how much business you can do. So it's all in your mindset. Mm -hmm. But the first thing I did, Jimmy, was I wanted to make sure everybody knew, everyone I knew, I needed them to know that I was a serious real estate professional and that I could help them in a way that wasn't too salesy. Like, hey, I'm a realtor, use me. Yeah. Yeah. That doesn't, that's kind of what everyone does. If you see what your competition is doing, if the swaths of people are doing it, you kind of want to do the opposite. Right. Mm -hmm. So A, you got to let people know what you're doing. Yeah. And a couple tactics on that was, this was 2010, no, no, 12. I had three years of new construction under my belt. So I, I was a salesperson, I had a little bit of experience, but even if you didn't have that, you don't need it per se. I went on Facebook Messenger and every green dot I saw, Meaning they were on Facebook they at that time? They were on Facebook at that time. I sent them a message and it was kind of um, generic but also customizable. Mm -hmm. So I had this thing that would say, hey Jimmy, it's been a while, looking forward to catching up. I just joined, at the time it was Remax, but you could say I just joined the number one Berkshire Hathaway team in my market. Here's some of the things we do to bring value. Hope to catch up soon. Insert personalization message. Thanks so much, Andrew Rondum. Here's my cell phone and new email. That's right. Boom, boom, right. boom. Yeah. How many did you do a day, would you say? Every person who was green, yeah. every person, they got the message. And, and, and every yeah. other day, yeah. there'd be new people on there. So the day one, 150 messages go out. I'm starting two-way conversations, right. which is just, hey, I'm here to help you. Remember that time we did that crazy thing in the basketball yeah. game? Insert personal message. Every The, the two-way conversations were off the charts. Yeah. That alone, Jimmy, I think I sold 36 to 42, I forget the number, deals my first year. I didn't have a CRM, I didn't have a website, yeah. and I was still learning the game. Mm -hmm. That's pretty good. Yeah, absolutely, it was good. And so give us an idea, what did some of those conversations, I mean, look, everybody's not gonna respond. Right. Was there, were there any that stood out or anything that jumped out or something? Maybe there was that one person that said, you know what, I got this referral for you, or it was like lightning in a bottle, some of those things. Relatively consistently, I'd say one out of 10. 10% of the people, because these are people, they like you and they you like them. Mm -hmm. And it's like, look, I'm not trying to sell anything. I'm just saying, this is what I'm doing now. Here's my new email. Here's a couple things we do. I'd say one out of 10 said, hey, my mom's gonna sell her house. Mm. I know you, you're gonna be great at this. They were supportive because I'm talking to people who already knew, liked, and, and trusted me. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they knew I was a, probably a relatively good salesperson and I was serious about it. Yeah. And I said, these are the serious things we can do to help you. Yeah. Check out my website. Dude, we're doing incredible things in the real estate game. I'm, we're trying to change the game. Up. Yeah, yeah, this is great. And listen, that was 2010. It's still, you still have green lights on Facebook as far as I know. It's they, easier now. It is easier now because now you've got Instagram, you've got LinkedIn, you've got all of these different platforms. It's really easy with all the connections we have to really make sure that everybody knows what you're doing and really just add value. The bottom line is, is give them something of value. You know, mention mm -hmm. some of the things like Andrew said that you're doing or that you do differently or that your company does differently. Just add a little bit of value, start the conversation. They wanna help you. Most of your, I mean, if, they, if, you're, if, they're, if you're out there and you're adding value to people, they're gonna to wanna to help. So that's a great way, making sure we let everybody know that we're doing those things. What else did you do to just jumpstart everything? Well, I was desperate to bring value to other business people in the community. Like that's I'm good. trying to be a business person here. And we happen to sell residential real estate. And one of the beautiful things about this business is everyone needs shelter. Everyone needs housing. I don't care if it's a rental, a house, a sale, a short-term rental. I will help anybody and try to do it as best as I, as I possibly can. Because if you treat that person like a human, they're going to refer you. This is a person who you can have a walking, talking billboard to. Mm -hmm. yeah. And not just clients, the other business 
right. people. So I would find other business people in the community and say, hey, if there's ever anything I can do to help you, we have a real estate company in, mm -hmm. in the city. Here's some of the things we do. Can I help you with your marketing? Is there anything I can do for your people? Is there anything that you see that we do that we might be able to help you? And even if they say no, they say they appreciate it. Mm -hmm. They say, hey, that, that guy's hustling. Yeah. He's for real. Yeah. Let me give you one thing that we're seeing right now, adding value to people. Yeah. If you're coming into this, and some of the folks that are in the business or they've come from a different marketplace or they're whatever it is, the things that you've done to have success, whether that be personally or in a, a, another business or right. even in school, I mean, some of these people that are coming, you know, these young people come out of school, they're great with social media. Imagine going to the local little um, I'm going to just use this flower shop in your area and just basically saying, hey, I noticed that I'm getting into the business new to real estate. What I'd love to do is I'd love to send you, I've seen some of the things that you're doing, love to send you a few social media graphics that might help your business. Love for you to keep me in mind in case you know someone. You take some photos outside that shop, you do a few things, you're there, you go into their shop and you take a picture of roses and whatever other type of flowers and say, which would you prefer for, for um, February 14th or for Valentine's right. Day? And you post that up there and have it where you tag them in there. The value you can bring to local businesses, if you've got any intellect right now on social media yes. or with photography or video, right now we're killing it with going in, interviewing those local. We were having this conversation yesterday with one of the best brand minds I know. Hands down. And he says, what was it he said about interviewing those folks? If I could go back and do it again, this is a great point. We were talking about, about a guy who grew a multi, multi-million dollar brand and he did it all on the back of the simple philosophy of civic pride. We're kind of in this world where there's a lot of negative news and that gets the clicks and we all know that. But you don't see many people walking around wearing a Fox hat or a CNN hat because right. it's just people don't want to be associated with toxicity all the time. Right. I would build a, a platform where it was all about all the positive things, civic pride about how great it is to live here. And it doesn't have to be your whole city. Like I live in a town called Bel Air, Maryland. It's half an hour north of Baltimore. I'm gonna go back and do this now. Yeah. I'm, I'm 12 years in, but I'm not. I'm ready to say, hey, this is why this town is awesome. Here's the, all the fun things going on. Here's what's going on with the local schools. The parents are involved over here. Hey, we got a new state champ over here. And just tell those stories, because that's the community of people who live, and people want to be associated with positive things. Mm -hmm. So day one, I'd start doing that. Hey, this is where I live. This is why we love it here. It's nothing about real estate. I mean, I guess maybe a sprinkle in the fact. They'll find out. They will. They'll say, who's doing this? Who's talking about all the awesome businesses and the people helping other people and the things we can be talked about? And people like to share that information, mm -hmm. Jimmy. Yeah. And when you do that for other people, you create fans for yourself. Absolutely. And that's this is the thing is, is especially, especially when you get very local with your business. Hyper local. And when you get hyper local with your business and shopping local and sharing local, all of a sudden now you become the resource and you're top of mind because people don't forget it when you do something for them. If you're doing something for someone, they won't ever forget it. So great foundational point. You were doing that. Everybody does it differently. There's so many different ways to do it now. Yes. So we've talked about when you first started, you want to make sure everybody knew that. You wanted to add value to other businesses yes. in here. What else did you do to really jumpstart everything? Well, the one thing I, I also, I was just such a student of the game. So you got to make sure you take time to really learn this business. There's a lot of things you need to learn to become a good realtor, a good real estate agent. You need to know these contracts inside and out. You need to know the process inside and out. Everyone wants to talk about the marketing and get attention here and let everyone know you, you know, that you're an agent. And that's important. You have to, they say without promotion, something, something terrible happens, Jimmy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What is that? Nothing. That's exactly right. Okay, P.T. Yes. Barnum said that. It's a yes. great quote. Without promotion, something terrible happens. Nothing. That's right. So you got to promote, but you also have to be really good. And I think one of the things I excelled at was I was just so dialed into learning everything I possibly could about being a real estate agent. Right. The contracts, the financing addendums, mm -hmm. the well, the septic, the jurisdictional addendums. I read it and read it and read it. And I didn't understand 60% of what I was reading. So I'd go find somebody, a mentor. So that's the third thing. You got to have someone who's helping you. And you got to be willing to ask for help and just admit, I don't know what this means. Mm -hmm. But pay attention, because when someone teaches you, you'll never have to ask that question again, and then you just own it. Yeah. Now, I want people to ask me about it, because I know, because Jimmy told me. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. So I, I was good at that. Yeah, and I, I, there were some practical things, as I remember also, that you did with open houses things. Was there oh, certain right. something in particular that well, you did? Well, I did four open houses every weekend. <laughs> that's all? Yeah. Yeah, every weekend. <laughs> Yeah. How would you do that? What did that practically look like? Because when you say four open houses, people are like, well, gosh, you've only got two days. How did you do those? 
Well, I did it from 11 to 1 and 1.30 to 2.30, or no, 1.30 to 3.30, two hour windows, 11 to 1, 1.30 to 3.30, every Saturday, every Sunday. And I came from a world where I worked a new home model. That was my job. Seven days a week, I sat in a finished model home and sold new homes. And to this day, Jimmy, when people aren't doing open houses and they don't realize the opportunity, and we talked about that, um, I think that's something we all could focus on. But if you're new, you gotta let everyone know what you're doing, find ways to bring value to other people, get in the game and an open house is, is a great way and make sure you know what you're doing yeah, and spend amazing. the time to make sure you know what you're doing. I yeah. think some yeah. of the agents population um, could miss that. And I think it gives some of us a bad name and gives the public a bad taste. Yeah. Um, but the good ones are unbelievably valuable to the economy, to the system, to their clients. And people know that. Yeah, don't overthink. If you're wanting to take your business to the next level, find some basic things. Andrew found what they were for him. I was, that's the model that works extremely well. But listen, if there's one of those that maybe you, it's just not your thing, find something else. Three to four, five basic things you're doing and your business can't help but grow. Hope this has been helpful and we'll talk to you soon. Today I got the honor to speak with Molly Slagle with Berkshire Hathaway Home Services Worldwide Realtors out of Houston, Texas. What I love about the way Molly does her business is she's so transparent with what's working. Uh, today she's going to share with you how she got started. Pretty unique way that she got started and got her first three deals that I'd never really even thought about that I know is going to help you. Also she goes in and she talks about how she adds value in her local community by doing community projects that's driving her business forward. This is one where I know you're going to leave with some ideas that you can apply in your business and it's going to help you grow. Let's get to it. All right. This is one I have been excited to get with Molly about this because um, Molly, I think I've kind of mentioned this. I have been watching your business from afar, almost like um, just kind of creeping around watching how, what you do on Instagram, how you're taking care of clients. And then all of a sudden you and I were on this call this past week for something with the brand. And I was like, oh, this is my chance. Uh, so I just reached out and I'm so thankful that you're willing to share some of this. Um, if somebody doesn't know you, just tell them a little bit about yourself, where you are, kind of your business, where it is right now. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for asking. I'm totally honored and it's, I'm super excited. Um, I'm Molly Slagle. I am out of the Houston, Texas area. I'm actually right in downtown Houston, Texas. I am with Berkshire Hathaway Home Services Worldwide Realtors. And uh, this past year, I finished number two in our company, which is super exciting. I sold um, right at about 11 million in real estate. I'm a solo act. Uh, I just hired an assistant. I am in my fourth year in business. I'm a former um, public educator, uh, uh, an educational diagnostician is what I specifically did. And I um, and I love real estate and I've grown my business using my sphere and social media and just, um, and every time I walk in a room, I say, hey, how's everyone doing? Who's looking to buy or sell some real estate today? <laughs> <laughs> that's so great. Uh, Molly, that, that's pretty interesting too, because four years, I mean, $11 million, that's, that is really, really strong. Tell me a little bit about when you first got started. You know, all of us, I think a lot of agents um, are at a place where they get to a place where they kind of almost, I mean, if you don't hit resistance, I always say you're probably not doing the right thing. Let's talk okay. about going back when you first got started. How did you first get started? What were some of the things you did right out of the gate? Okay, so um, I got my license out of spite. I should say that first. I um, was totally a spite license. I really wanted my kitchen renovated and I knew I had to make money to do it. And so I, um, I knew I, I could find a way to do it in real estate. So that was the first thing. Then the second thing was I realized once I, and it was because, you know, I was, I, I needed to find a way to do it quickly. And I, and I had something I really wanted and this was a great way. Well, then I realized you could get your license, but you, you don't just get clients. So I had to figure that out. So what I did was any person and I will tell anybody who asks me first, I drank two glasses of wine and then any person who had ever tried to sell me leggings or uh, shakes or workout programs or any of that stuff. I got on Facebook messenger and I sent them a message and said, I am so glad I got to support you all these years in leggings and, you know, nails and all of that. Can you pretty please, um, 
if anybody asks you who's buying and selling real estate or who wants to buy or sell real estate, that I'm your girl. Can, I just need you to do that. You don't have to buy a thing from me, but this is what I need. And if you know anybody, please send me their name. And I want you to know, I got my first three leads from that. And that's how Ooh. I got my business rolling. Yep. It took two glasses of wine and a little bit of gusto. <laughs> and so how many do you think you sent out? I'm just curious. How many of those private messages do you think you sent out roughly? I mean, I, I had been drinking some wine, but probably about 40. <laughs> <laughs> See, but this is the thing. I mean, and you think about that. It sounds like a lot, but 40. I mean, mm -hmm. I'll promise you there's more people you supported over the years than 40 people. Oh, so like many more. Said, yeah, you know? but I all I did, and I, I, I just typed up this little note that just said, you know, I was so glad to come to all of your things and buy the things. And would you mind doing this for me? And all I did was change whatever it was they had been selling at the time. And some of them weren't even selling that stuff anymore. But if I had gone, you know, I felt like it was a, a tit for tat. And I didn't feel bad asking because they had asked me. So it no. took away that like uncomfortable, um, you know, I wasn't cold calling them. I was just following up. So. Yeah. You know what? Everything has a name. So should this like be the um, Molly two glass of wine sphere of influence program? I mean, I maybe mean it, whatever, yeah. right? Three yeah. people. That's incredible. That was your first three leads though, right? Yeah. So, and it was, and that represented a, over $600,000 worth of real estate. Come on, you know, yeah, cause, right, yeah. right out great. of the gate. Right. And cause my first, well, my very first lead, and I don't really count this one. My first one was a referral from our company, but when I had to, and, and you know, that one was fine and it was great. But when I had to generate my own business, which was right off of that, that's exactly right. how I did it. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's so good. So let's talk about it then. Okay. So now you've got the ball rolling. Where did you go from there? How did you begin to build your database, build your kind of, um, and just make your sphere of influence go larger or maybe even um, choose some specific areas that you wanted to grow your business in? So I really, um, the one, I didn't want to spend a bunch of money because remember I wanted to renovate my kitchen. Right. So I needed to figure out a way to do it inexpensively. And I had a pretty good foothold on Facebook in general. I, I think Facebook has changed over the years, you know, but I had a good foothold there um, because I had taught some fitness classes. I'd been involved in some um, social, you know, junior league and these kinds of things over the years. And I, um, what I did was I just started being very intentional in my posting online and I didn't do it in a, um, Hey, I'm so salesy now. Like watch me. It was just a, Hey, I'm so lucky. I got a chance now that I'm selling real estate to come see this beautiful home, you know, and I would, um, I just did a lot of that. And then I started trying to share the things I would learn along the way, like, Hey, you know, we've sold and we've bought and sold real estate over the years, but I never knew that title insurance is actually purchased from the, you know, it covers the past. It doesn't even cover what you would think insurance normally covers the future, you know, just that kind of stuff. Yeah. And back then we weren't even really doing the video, right. That was just like mm -hmm. meme pictures and, and typing out. Right. And then, um, I, so I started there and, and that really grew my business on social media. And then I am a big time I was, and I've gotten back to it, but if it is somebody's birthday, boy, they're getting a birthday card. If somebody's mm -hmm. having a baby, if somebody's child is graduating, if any of those things, I mean, I literally keep a stack of cards right here, right here. And I sit down and do them. And, um, and that just helps people feel cared for. And, and so I started, I'd send the letters then I would get on social media and say, one of the ways I really am making myself different is I care for my clients. And then people would get a card in the mail and they'd be like, Oh, she, she walks her own walk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so you still doing that. You're still sending the cards. Constantly. Yeah, well, my, well, my assistant helps me now. So great. Yeah. That's <laughs> we've great. grown so much. It's right. hard to keep track of it all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's talk about that as, as your social media grew, did it grow by you requesting and uh, friend request, mm -hmm. or was it just, mm -hmm. it began to come that way or how did you do that? Both. I would request every time I would have a little bit of a connection with somebody, I would request them. And I would then send not just like, hi, I'm requesting your friendship and I'm not going to ever message you. I would right. request their friendship. And then I would send them a little note like, hey, I saw that we have so and so in common or, you know, I, I met you at this tournament or whatever it may be. Um, and I just wanted to connect and I would indicate a little note and then just say, you know, thanks for thanks for the ad or whatever. Or if it was somebody that I had really spent time with, I would say, would you ever like to meet up and have like a cup of coffee or whatever to try to make that connection? 
So that's you're doing that on social media. Did you move that into a CRM of any sort or how are you operating everything now? Now that it's grown. So it started on a spreadsheet, you know, because that's yeah. life. Right. So yes. I started on a spreadsheet. Um, actually, I started on a yellow legal pad, if I'm being totally honest, that right. is how I started it. And it was just like, yeah, until I'd run out of pages. And then I was like, oh, I should probably put this on some Excel, which I didn't know how to do. You know, I made it through graduate school twice. I did not know how to use Excel. So whatever. I took a quick little class and then I made that. And then I landed on follow up boss. That is where I rest my business right now. <clears throat> it's working for me. I think the price is right for what I need. And I, um, and it, and it just gets the job done and I, it's, it's intuitively designed with the way I think. So it works. So, I mean, I'm, and I love follow up boss. Let me ask you this. When you're utilizing that, are you sending like uh, systematic, like every month or is it, mm -hmm. is it, how does this look as far as your communication to that database now? So I do send. it depends on where they're falling in my plan. Like if they're a buyer and I know they're going to come down, you know, they're not going to buy right now. I have a, a feed for them. I have a feed for everybody that does, you know, holidays and that kind of thing. And then I have um, a feed for people who have already have closed with them. And these are the, I have a handout that I give at every closing that tells you what you should do seasonally for your home. And then that is the feed that you get on after you've closed with me and it mm -hmm. auto emails. I will be honest. I had the hardest time with those drip campaigns. I didn't like any of them. They felt so uh, impersonal. And so I sat down and typed my own That's and, okay. and that, and, and they're not great, that, but they are, you can tell that it's me typing, you know, writing to my mm -hmm. clients. I felt like that made a difference. And I tried everything, but I finally bit the bullet and said, the way to do it, it has to be authentic for me. I'm going to have to write it myself. No, I think it's well worth the time. Well, I think especially today, we get so many of these just paid for emails that come out or these just, you know, that everybody's doing. I think people can tell. I know I can. And yep. it, it is and it, in reality, it makes a huge difference because we're all getting certain things. Um, when I know that something's coming from you, I almost think sometimes that some of these some of these things that we send out, somebody will say, oh, you forgot to misspell that. Well, you know that that was me then. You know, I mean, mean, obviously, yep. I'm not even, you know, it's about the content and it's about the personal um, touches and those things. You've done this in a pretty unique way, too, because as your business has grown, you've become so involved with your communities and with your people. Yeah. Um, I have heard from some mutual friends of ours that I need to ask you about Starbucks. I don't even know where <laughs> this is going. Tell me a little bit about what you're doing with Starbucks. OK, so I've. I've said that I am a former public educator, worked in that realm, and we all know that teachers love coffee, and we yes. know that parents need it to get them going in the morning. So what I started doing was I had to figure out a way to get all the people that I love coffee on the first day of school, and there was no way I could do it on my own with, like, showing up. So I bought a gift card on my phone, and I, I'll show you. I screenshotted it. This one's empty or I wouldn't just pop it up here for everyone to see. <laughs> but um, I just took a, and I, I mean, I even see it. So I took a, yeah. put some money on a card like this and I screenshotted it. And then when I screenshotted it, I put it online and I'm going to show you another picture. Um, I put it online with a little thing that just says, Hey, teachers and parents, welcome back to school. Um, if you take this gift card, it's a free coffee. Just tag me. Hashtag Molly sold it. Oh, that's so good. And I put it on my stories on Instagram. I put it on Facebook and I, I set it up so it would add $15 incrementally, but it would send me, I'm sorry, that's my dog, Mike. Um, uh, it, Mike wants to be on the show. I know. My, I, I'll put, I'll pick him up here in a minute. Um, <laughs> anyway, but I, uh, I put it so that I could check, you know, I'd set my budget. I was going to do about $200, 250 and I would do it in $15 increments. So I could watch it to make sure that I didn't like actually pay $400 or something. Right. But I ended up that reach on social media was insane. I should have let it go for $400 because mm -hmm. It, they would tag me, they would buy their coffee and do a video. They would tag me. Everyone was so excited Very about the coffee and it has, it, it has that same impression every time I do it. So I do it on the first day of school. I do it on the first day back to school from Christmas break. And then I'll do it like just randomly here and there, you know, just, Hey, it's like, I think I might do it for Valentine's day 
you know, have a coffee with your sweetie or whatever. But um, then I turned each of those social media posts when they tagged me, I turned them into a little video and I played that as an ad on my um, Facebook and Instagram. And, yeah. and it was like, does your realtor take, you know, give you coffee and that kind of thing. And it's so, I mean, this is, I mean, you couldn't have bought that kind of advertising for what you were paying on those coffees. I mean, with that, because they're sharing that when they're sharing that on their social media, you're hitting their entire, I mean, it's like, it just exactly. echoes Explodes. out. Yes. So a uh, fun thing, my very last coffee I sold the first day I ever did this. Um, and mind you, I'm in Houston, Texas. It went all the way to, um, uh, Fort Knox, Tennessee spent my last really? $7. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So good. Yeah. yeah. Listen, you I mean, I love this. I love these ideas and this kind of thing that you're doing. You do some unique stuff also. I know when we were on a call a little while ago, you talked about getting a photographer, but a little bit different kind of twist on that. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. And it's going down again this Saturday. So I, you know, we have this love and hate relationship with Valentine's Day, don't we? So I know we all love our pets the most. And so I hire a photographer and we go to a local park here in downtown Houston area and I invite everybody to pretty please bring their pets, your cats, your dogs, your pigs, whatever. I don't know what you got, but come on down. And I do um, pet portraits and I get all the cute little Valentines, you know, with the comments and the hearts and the lips. And then we just set them up and you can take a portrait with your pet or a portrait just of your pet. Um, and I negotiate a rate, obviously, with my photographer. But the point of this one is that my clients and community feel loved on because that is really like that's my job is to help people feel good where we live and for people to love where we live because we have cool stuff that happens. You know, that's my main job. But the benefit to me is that I get their email addresses for my database. That's how I deliver the photos. And so, and I don't put them on some aggressive drip campaign after that they get on the drip campaign. That is happy holidays. That is, you know, now's the time of year to go pick blueberries. This is where you should go, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, never actually selling them a thing on that drip campaign. Never once, but the pet portraits. Oh my gosh. And then I have people. So this year we're, because it's COVID we we did sign up genius, but in the past I have people just stop by with their dogs and say, can I have a picture too? And that is money for me because that's somebody I never would have reached otherwise to get their email address. And, and here I am getting it. Where do you set this up? I mean, you've got to have some kind of central location where you're targeting where you want to be. Is there a certain specific place you do this? Mm -hmm. I do it in my farm, but I advertise it on social media. So I have a, I have a mm -hmm. geographic farm. It's my neighborhood and a few neighborhoods around. It's just over about 1500 houses is about what I farm regularly. Um, and so I, I reach out to all of them, but really my reach comes more there when social media, you know, the, so I send it out in my newsletter, I post on the Facebook page, but the people come from social media and I have people come from all of the surrounding, you know, communities of Houston, yeah. um, yeah. down cause it's downtown and it's fun. Bring your dog, walk the Buffalo Bayou. It's gorgeous. Yeah. And it's not too hot yet. So great. I mean, these are such great ideas. Um, listen, I know, um, you and I, I've talked about this right before we came on. <clears throat> There's such a power in having to be able to share ideas like this and to be able yeah. to get ideas as well. And the association talk to me a little bit about um, the, the impact. I know you've been a part of the national rethink council um, now. T tell me a little bit about the power of having that group of individuals or like a mastermind group. Um, if some of these agents that are out there, they're trying to figure all this out. Yeah. There's opportunity to join up. I mean, the Rethink Council has been incredibly invaluable to me. One, it's because when I feel like giving up, when I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, every day as entrepreneurs, we wake up unemployed, right? We have to like right. keep going. Right. You have to find a new job every day. And, and I think the reason businesses burn out is because the entrepreneur loses their vision. And um, we have to, you know, remember every day what our vision was when we started our business and having those Rethink members and just other really great mastermind groups I have through a variety of things. Um, they help me remember me, <laughs> like who was that girl who started this business? Really the one who, once she had rolled through the kitchen renovation, you know, that girl who was like, wow, this could really be a thing. Um, and then I love it that I can reach out to them and say, guys, I think it's, I think I want to do something like, and then shoot out an idea. And then before I know it, 
we've chatted it into this well-developed thing, you know, that, and then it happens in my market, it happens in their market, and we can see how it goes. A good example of that was the movie night, uh, renting out the movie theater and giving away the tickets. Everyone had to register and all of that. And um, how, how each of us did that a little differently. And then how each of us carried it into the COVID times with a drive through or a drive-in movie. Mm-hmm. I didn't do it that way. I did a movie delivery night to every home. They got popcorn and a red box, you know, but That's I love cool. that when we talk together, we can make those ideas just explode into something that isn't just an idea. It's an event. It's a something that's memorable, you know, and, and they're just awesome. And when you have a, you know, a tough day, you can be like, guys, do you, I know if anybody understands what I'm going through today, it's you. And that, so they're, it's, I, I am, I cannot say how transformative being a member of that committee has been for me personally and professionally. Yeah. And I'll tell you this, not everybody can be on the Rethink Council, but there is an ability for you to generate your own type of mastermind. Um, There are so many uh, Facebook groups out there for real estate yeah. agents. Whether you're a new agent, you can find other new agents. If there's you're looking for, you know, a mastermind group, there's like real estate masterminds and all yeah. these things are out there that really you don't have to spend a ton of money to get no. involved with a group of people. So um, it's so powerful. Now that you brought it up, uh, let's talk a little bit about um, what you did with the uh, movie night, because this is so incredible. Like right now, everybody's <laughs> like, oh, we can't do anything right now. And here it is. Like you say, you did with the red box. and everything. Talk about how that looked, who you offered it to, kind of just the execution of it, if you don't mind. Okay, so it's super simple. Um, and it went over amazingly. I should also say I have a 14 year old daughter and with this is a family business. Okay. So I had some hands on deck and I ordered from Amazon and I wish I had, I had one in my hand right now, but I'd show it to you if I did those plastic red and white striped popcorn containers. And I think I spent $20 maybe on 45 or 50. So I, and I did, I ended up doing about 200 of them. And, Mm -hmm. um, then I ordered Orville Redenbacher microwave popcorn. And on that package, I bought, I bought online from Redbox. You can buy just the codes for Redbox. Mm -hmm. And I bought 200 Redbox codes. And then I ordered from Etsy, this cute little thing that says something about popping on by, you know, or like a pop, it's a movie thing. It has popcorn on it. And I had my daughter handwrite each code onto the onto the card then we taped it to the popcorn then we put it in the container and then we drove them around town and we dropped them at everybody's front door i delivered 200 of them well I'll, i'm telling a lie i delivered 150 of them and let me tell you what i did with the rest so first of all everybody tagged me and said movie night on molly and they had so much fun they all rented their red box and then we went to the walgreens where the red boxes were. And I took all of those extra 50 popcorn containers and I set them on top of the red boxes at like four Walgreens. So when people walked out to get their, you know, they just bought their, probably picked up a prescription or whatever. And they're walking out and they're like, what is all this popcorn? And they pick one up and inside is a popcorn and a code. And so they rented their red box and they took their popcorn home. And so, you know, I don't even know whatever came of all of that, but it didn't matter because it said hashtag Molly sold it. And, you know, that if they went home and was like that crazy realtor, I just got a movie on her. I'm like, well, or you maybe you'll call me one day. And if not, I hope you like the movie. See, Molly, I think it's all about the heart, too. I mean, obviously, you're just a giving person. I mean, I know as I've talked to a number of people that know you pretty well, they just said one of the first things that, um, well, I talked to two people today very close to you, and both of them said she truly does love people. And I was like, yeah, I can tell that. And so when you're doing those things, listen, a lot of times we, we get so caught up in doing all these things for our business that we forget that there's just an impact that we can make out there that, um I promise you it comes back in spades. It does. Uh, this, this this has been tremendous. Listen, if somebody I, just, I can't thank you enough for all the sharing that you've done today. If somebody um, has a referral to send out Houston way, how would it be the best way for them to get in touch with you? Well, you can hit me up at molly at mollysoldit.com or you can get me on Instagram, Molly Sold It. Or on Facebook, Molly Slagle, any of those, and um, or just text me. My number's on all those places, 713-471-0527. You'll get me directly, and I will really personally take care of your clients 
And when they ride into town, the first thing they get is a super nice dinner on me. You can ask my recent referrals how much they enjoyed it. <laughs> that is so great. Um, listen, I would encourage everybody that's listening also to go out and follow all of Molly's stuff, because I will promise you, you're going to see the way it should be done. So Molly, thanks so much for everything. Thank Guys, you. reach out to Molly. Tell her how much you appreciate how transparent she was and how much she helped you. We'll talk to you guys soon. Wondering what you can do to take your business to the next level with video. I've got the best in the business, in my opinion, Brad McCallum. He's going to share with us exactly what he does to create the videos and distribute them in the way that adds value to his clients. You're not going to want to miss this one. All right, Brad, this is an interview I've been really looking forward to. I kind of share with you that uh, I first found you actually through an intern that was working with me that uh, actually became my videographer and just said, you got to check out Brad's stuff. It's so good. And this has now been a couple of years ago. So to watch how everything has come about for you has just been um, pretty exciting. And I'm really excited to get you. Uh, so for us to get an opportunity really to share some of these things that you're doing, they're so systematic, so repeatable that are just um, really um, setting you apart in your local market. Brad, if you don't mind, just introduce yourself a little bit about where you are, how you got started, and then we'll bring it into talking about the, how video is affecting your business. Yeah, absolutely. So first off, I gotta say, Jimmy, thank you so much for having me on, man. It's an honor to be involved in in any way and to be a part of this. I'm a big fan of what you've been doing, the content, your writings, all that stuff. So thanks so much. Um, my name is Brad McCallum. I'm going to Calgary, Alberta. I've had my license for five years. I've been full-time about three years ago. Um, about three and a half years ago, just over three and a half years ago, I started um, uploading uh, to YouTube. Um, basically what happened was I got my license, I had no clients and I came face to face with that reality that there's no reason to work with Brad McCallum. Absolutely should not do it. I don't have the experience. I don't know the area. I'm not a local area expert. I don't know how to negotiate. I thought I needed something that was bigger than just my ego to actually attract clients. And at the end of the day, um, what was kind of interesting about when I came to, to, so I came up in the business was we were in a very deep recession and knowing that our market's facing potentially a bit of a shift. We know at least on the stock market, we're in a recession, but knowing that there could be a shift in front of us here. Um, what's kind of interesting and not even so worrisome to me is that that's where I built my brand was I, I realized that there were people in my market that were only having a 38% chance of selling their homes. So 62% of the time, a home would not sell that hit the market. And a lot of those families were either people that were having to sell their home at a certain price. Otherwise they were going to be underwater on their mortgage, or they wouldn't even have enough to pay out their mortgage, or they wouldn't have enough for their first month, first month's uh, rental deposit or security deposit on their new rental. Like people were trying to rebuild their lives here. There were lots of layoffs, lots of challenges. And so even though um, in hindsight, creating a large YouTube channel and an audience and being known for creating high quality listing videos, which is, I think, the way most agents uh, know me, um, none of that was on purpose of building a brand for myself. It was because there was a lot of families that were in a lot of need of selling their homes at a good price so they could actually rebuild their lives. And I think there's a possibility that, you know, in certain markets, we might be facing some of that in the next 18 to 24 months. And if that's a reality, the question that I really came to terms with was not just why choose me, but really the bigger question for all of us should be is what's in it for them? Like if someone's going to work with us, what's in it for them? And so I just chose from day one in my career to wake up and ask myself that question and then work on the answer. And that's been the biggest thing that's helped me. Um, that answer has helped me try to learn things like analytics and how to leverage my content so more people could see it. Because the more people that saw it, there was a higher uh, likelihood that someone would maybe be a buyer for that property or know a buyer for it. So the whole answer to that question is what taught me how to create more exciting content, how to get that content watched longer, and then how to use that content to actually leverage it on different platforms like Instagram and TikTok, not just YouTube. And then how to make sure that at the end of the day, it wasn't just serving my own ego of like me on camera, hey, I'm number one top producer, the best or anything like that, but how I could always make sure that that original message of what's in it for them, that the home was the star and that the rest of us were just the, uh, the B actors in it. 
Um, I, I tell you, Brad, this is that's one of the things I love about your videos is um, the authenticity of being who you are um, in the videos. And also it just comes through. It seems like you just you make the you make the home the hero in every video and, and highlight that home in a way. And I know that a lot of people, you know, here we are. I mean, you got 33, 31,000 plus subscribers now. Um, and this didn't just happen overnight. A lot of times it seems like um, when I'm talking with agents that they'll say, well, I tried the video thing and it just didn't work. It's almost like a lot of people just don't realize that how things compound over time. You want to speak to that and maybe give some encouragement to those people that are just starting on the video side of this and kind of what it took, how, much, how long it took and how that compounded, if you don't mind. Yeah. So first off, I'll say to any agent that says video is not for them, um, you're just wrong. I have now seen so many agents in small markets, large markets, ultra competitive markets, markets that it doesn't seem like anyone has any interest in. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if the agent's older, younger, attractive, ugly, whatever it might be. That agent can be successful in their market if they're delivering content that's of value or entertaining to their audience. So then the question is, is, well, what has value and what's entertaining, right? And as you work on that answer, you're going to find more and more of your audience. But in the beginning, just by the nature of it, when you start a YouTube channel, um, it feels like you might be spending 30, 40, 50 hours a month and you go from 60 subscribers to 70 subscribers. And you're like, holy smokes. 10 people, maybe seven of them aren't even in my market and never moving to my market. So what was the point of doing all this? I could have just bought that attention, uh, you know, or those leads uh, through other services. So why would I do this? I'm building my own brand. And the reality is, is that compound interest in your personal brand is what grows your business. So I read a book very early on, on in my career called Talk Triggers by Jay uh, Bear. And Talk Triggers, it's all about the only way to really grow your business in a meaningful way is to grow your sphere of influence. The only way to grow your sphere of influence, you know, apart from just the actual belly to belly, like going golfing with more people or hanging out with this piece or joining that club or, you know, going to this dinner party, it's actually trying to find something that people in your sphere or outside of your sphere is worth talking about, right? So like we talk about our friends, we talk about other people's lives, what's going on, things of interest. And also to our own friends, we want to share things that we think they might be interested in. So if we've got a friend that's shopping for a home, right, and you've seen something that might be of interest to them, right, like everyone knows an auntie or a mother who'll be like, oh, dear, I know you're shopping for a house. I saw this house in my neighborhood. And you're like, well, obviously, I'm not interested. <laughs> like, what are the odds that I'm interested in that one particular house, right? But it's that same sort of concept is like, that's how humans interact with each other. We're always trying to bring value to each other, to our friendships, to our family, to our markets, whatever it might be. So when someone sees a video, they're like, oh, wow, this, this is kind of cool. Like I'm going to pass on Brad's name. You should see what he's doing. Or you're thinking of selling your home or you're unsuccessfully currently trying to sell your home. Okay. Well, you know what? I saw this other guy and he's doing this stuff. I mean, it's, he seems to be busy all the time. They've always got lots of stuff going on. They've got a really big audience, lots of thousands of views on their stuff. Like you've got an interesting house, you know, maybe he can help you. And that word of mouth is what takes our sphere of influence and helps it really, really grow. So in the beginning, growing your channel, just 10 subscribers doesn't seem like a whole lot, but that compound interest that, you know, that story of like, well, if you, put a hundred bucks in on your 18th birthday. And every month you put a hundred bucks in and eventually you're a millionaire. Same thing's true about your personal brand is that you'll get to that point that you'll still spend that 40 or 50 hours when you've got 10,000 subscribers and you'll still grow by 15%, but now you're growing 1500 subscribers in a month. Right. And that is the difference. That's how this scales and gets so far away from what you ever imagined. Like that's how, like in the beginning, it was like almost, I remember I, I stood on stage at R4 and I was asked to speak to a room of people right before COVID hit. So just about two and a half years ago now, and I had 700 subscribers, um, one minute of my content, uh, or there was about eight hours of my content watched in a 24 hour day. And I thought, how can I stand in front of a room of agents that sell way more real estate than me? and tell them about what they should be doing with video and marketing and YouTube and Instagram. And the reality was, is that the industry is a better judge of what's going to work 
than maybe even my own self-doubt or even my own market, right? Like the industry is a great canary in the coal mine for like, that guy's doing something of interest. That's going to work. We should follow that. We should emulate that. And so when they said, oh, Brad, you should go on and talk about YouTube. Well, that was 30,300 subscribers ago, you know, and it took me probably 18 months to get to that 700 subscribers, right. you know, and then it only, and then I got to 20,000 in the next 18 months. So the compound interest effect was, was absolutely massive. Now my channel gets watched almost 30 minutes for every one minute of real time. Mm. So 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, the days that I'm sick, the days I'm with my family, the days I'm with another client, the days I'm traveling, the days I want to go golfing with my friends, 24 hours a day, we're getting that times 30 of our content watched. And it's not cold calling or door knocking because they're the ones pressing play. Yeah. Brad, speak to that a little bit. I mean, it's so amazing when you start thinking about the compounding of this, you know, there is a big difference between making outbound calls or generating those things because you're, you're, you're coming from a place of being um, a salesperson. What does it do with the video though? What's the difference there? Well, I mean, it's the difference between someone calling you up and saying, Hey, can you list my house? Or are you calling up a bunch of people randomly and saying, Hey, are you interested in buying or selling a house? Right. I mean, it's a completely different um, dichotomy of the relationship, right? Like if, if someone says, Hey, like, I want to talk to you about this business opportunity. You're like, what are you trying to sell me? What's going on? You're immediately on your defense. Right. But if you know, a trusted expert and you say, Hey, um, I'd like to ask you about this or that the trust has already been built enough for them to reach out to you. So I don't do uh, any advertising outside of that. In the in recent months, we've been testing a little bit uh, with uh, my friend Jimmy Mackin over at Curator. Yeah. Um, like Jimmy's a pal. And so what we're checking is like, can we do some of our short form video with a little bit of what, what they do on the campaign side to see if we can generate even warmer leads? But still the vast majority of like our low hanging fruit is the person that's like, saw your YouTube video moving to Calgary, saw your YouTube video. Can you come list my house? And those calls all are happening all day long, every day. And I think that's really the power of it that people forget, right? It's that, that upfront cost, those, those early days of YouTube at 40 or 50 hours a week, right? Like if you akin that to say door knocking in the beginning, right? Like at, at best, let's say the, those 40 or 50 hours result in two deals. Well, you know that today, 40 or 50 more hours of door knocking is going to result in two deals, right? And that's the problem is that it does not scale, right? Because you're so key in doing it. You're, at best, you can use other humans and their hours to scale it, but that's not even a great way to do it in, in the long run, in my opinion, um, because I've found now that even on my YouTube channel, rather than me trying to hog the spotlight or make it about me, I'm trying to use the audience that we've built as a way to elevate the agents on my teams, mm -hmm. have them be in some of the listing videos, have them stand alongside me because Brad wants to go on vacation with his family. And I want someone to say like, who called us after watching a YouTube video and saying, man, I'd love for you to come list our house. I can say, Hey, you know, Caitlin, or, you know, Melinda, she was in that video here. She's awesome. Um, Melinda is going to come out to your house this week. I'm going to set you up with an introduction to her. I'm just away right now. And they don't feel like they're, oh, well, I didn't get Brad. So I'm now going to go elsewhere. Right. So the, the opportunities for leveraging it is, is it, it's really massive. And it's far. And I've stumbled upon this, not been intelligent enough to foresee it. That's no. for sure. Well, once you figured it out, though, you went all in. And this is what I love, Brad, is the way that you have literally, in my opinion, I've had a number of agents who will ask me, OK, well, if I'm going to do more video, especially as an agent from a marketing standpoint, what should I do? And I send them to your channel. I want to encourage anybody that's listening right now, go out and see this. I mean, what Brad's doing and the home of Gallon Group, I mean, I, was, I noticed you, you're in having your other agents that are part of the team being in there. What you're doing is something that is repeatable. So let's get real practical for folks. Yeah. Let's talk about, you know, if you're going out to shoot a video, you're storyboarding it a little bit before you go. What is it that you found? Because I know you're constantly refining and looking at the analytics. What are you finding that the typical time frame is, the beginning shot, the ending shot, all the things in between? If you can break that down a little bit, that'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. So, I mean, to, to break that down, you have to understand first off what YouTube wants. YouTube is an ad platform. Their only goal on YouTube is to sell ads. And so what allows them to sell ads? Well, length of time on platform, 
That's simple. So a user comes to the platform, they start watching a few videos. What do they do in response to those videos? Did they watch a video that made them to go on and watch another four or five videos in a series? That's great. That means YouTube has a longer length of duration of uh, viewing time and can show more ads during that. So then they're like, hey, that guy's content is entertaining. It's engaging. Let's share it on YouTube here. We'll create more revenue and we'll reward Brad with some algorithm juice because of it, right? Or you create unentertaining content that's sort of boring, sort of bland, right? And they show it to a sample set of users and they say, yeah, people left the platform. They didn't like it. Maybe you shared the link on Facebook and they went to YouTube, even though they're in Facebook mode, left after 30 seconds, went back and, and YouTube's like, oh my gosh, we can't show them that guy's stuff because that guy's stuff is unengaging and it ends the session, right? So for understanding sort of the analytics around your videos, it's all about how do I keep a viewer watching my video longer? And so the real basic structure of my YouTube tours are based around one simple concept that I need to hook their attention in the first five to 10 seconds. And so hooking their attention, you, you know, you can use fireworks and speedboats and all that stuff, or you can just use something that's of high value to them. Like, you know, it might be a question of like, is the housing market crashing here in Calgary? Is there any more hope to sell your home at these high prices, right? Like it might be a sentence that's just like that either evokes some fear or evokes some emotion or evokes some sort of interest, right? Or I'm about to show you a home, you know, a mega mansion with a 25, million, uh, 25 meter indoor lap pool, right? And someone might be like, cool. I want to see that. I want to be entertained, right? Or this is the home that Leonardo DiCaprio stayed in during the filming of The Revenant starting now. And people are like, okay, that's an interesting hook, right? So I want that first five to 10 seconds, but I have not yet bought a viewer for a five, seven, 12 minute video. So the next thing I want to do is get them past that 10 second hump all the way to 30 or 35 seconds. If you can get someone, and so that means you show people the highlights first. Agents like to hold off on the best thing to the end because they think, oh, great, people will stick around for it. The problem is you got 15% of your audience left at that time. Show them the best stuff first and be like, okay, this is exciting. This is exciting. And people, if they love it, they'll stick around. Now they're kind of curious, like how many bedrooms, right? And like, oh, there's a nice spice pantry here. Like they will stick around for the little details if you can give them the, the heat off the, butt, off the bat. So my basic structure, five to 10 second hook, then another 10 seconds of high impact, beautiful cinematography of different shots of the home that makes a, a user know, even without saying it out loud, what's in it for them. The next 20 seconds or so, it's me saying, I don't even introduce myself. I don't even say, hi, it's Brad McCallum with Real Broker out of Calgary, Alberta. I just say, hey, if you've been looking for a home in this Western community on the edge of Calgary, you want to be close, drive out to the mountains, you want to be close to some of the best shops and restaurants here and some of the or city's best schools. And during that time, whatever I'm saying with my audio, I'm using B-roll video shots to enforce it. Some of our city's best schools, mountains, shots of the mountains, shots of those that shopping, right? Back to me on the street. On the street, I'm choosing something that's got action or contrast or interest in the background, right? Maybe it's a beautiful field behind the house, right? And then I say, well, cool. Then in that case, you're going to love today's uh, tour. We're going to take you inside and then give them the highlights. It's 2,800 square feet, six bedrooms, four bathrooms, whatever it might be. And then you take them inside. And so if you can get them through that first minute, minute and a half, I don't care if 40% of the audience is gone because most of the time people are clicking and popping off everyone. Like Mr. Beast only gets 45, 50% of his videos watched, right? So it's like, if I can get, you know, on a video that's got 30,000 views, that's 15 minutes long. If I can get 12,000 of those views to stick around pretty much to minute 14, I've gotten 14 minutes of someone's time times 12,000. Think about the amount of trust you've built with them during that time, right? I think about the amount of uh, that they've got to know you and, and, and also during that time, like, are you breaking down what they believe a real estate agent is, right? Are you changing what their thoughts are on the industry? Um, are they, are you presenting the home in a way that shows that you actually know something about the property? Uh, one of the unintended consequences of listing videos at a high level was uh, we in a, in a balanced market will double end or bring the buyer 19% of the time to our own listings. 
Yeah. Industry yeah. average is about four and a half percent. Yeah. That was unintended, but it's like, well, why? Because the reason why you call up your niece who just got licensed is because you fundamentally don't believe that one agent is different than another agent from a value proposition. But if you're looking at a video and you're thinking, okay, well, this person really knows the property. I've got some serious questions about that community, the schools, that the building of that house, the structure that, that actually, you know, envelops it. Like, is that property a good property? Well, this guy knows, let's just call him directly. And that's another really cool, um, you know, sort of side effect from it. And then every agent I think wants to do volume business, right? So business where they've got a partner that is going to give them more than one or two great listings a, a year, right? And so what we are in Calgary is a marketing company that also sells real estate. right? And so because of that, great builders, some of the most talented people on planet earth, right? Like the best singers are not the ones on stage. They're in their basement somewhere. They just don't have an audience, right? The best builders and architects and designers oftentimes are great architects, builders, and designers and horrible on social media, right? No, they're, they're practicing their art, but it's in a vacuum. No one really knows about it. And so once again, the purpose of our channel is not to just have everyone know about Brad McCallum and our listings. It's to elevate their brands and their businesses. So they look at us as how do we get more from Brad than we give up to Brad? And really, as agents, we forget this, right? Especially if we've won a few awards and we've done well in our business, we start to think that it's a privilege for people to work with us. And, and the reality is it's, it's, there's a lot of great agents that are really capable agents and good people who might do just as, as well as us. And if, they were a little bit, if we were a little bit less busy like they are, we might even be able to service them better, right? So, so what else can you add, right? And so for me, I was like, I want builders designers, partners to see like, my goodness, Brad can be in my, my marketing department, my HR department. He can be uh, my realtor as well. So then when it's like, oh, the home didn't sell. Well, Brad, what did you do? Did you follow up with that guy that was in last week? All that stuff. I can say, well, listen, you know, we've gotten now 90,000 minutes of watch time of a highly professional, high quality tour of your home, which means that rather than cleaning your home for 30 low qualified showings, right? Your home was cleaned once and then presented extremely professionally. So that person that comes out and doesn't realize that your home faces the train tracks, we address that in the video, right? So now you're not going to clean your house up, get your six month out, old out, your two year old, uh, old out of the house, clean it all Saturday morning for an afternoon showing, come back just to find out that they left after eight minutes on the Nest Cam because you know what? Oh, we didn't really realize what the property looked like from the pictures. And it's like, so the, the goal of this is transparency, right? So people understand those pieces. Um, so that's a, yeah, that's a little bit on that. And then yeah. and the this, network uh, effect is what's, is what's, what's wild from it is the way that grows. Well, that's, and that, that's, that's the beauty of it is, is it's not just compounding the time and the views and the branding. It's now taking you to another level of someone, like you said, that is viewing this as, they're getting more even than they, you know, whereas the whole idea yeah. that you hear in the general community is, is what is the value of a real estate agent? And they're overpaid. And, you know, I mean, I'm, you know, most people um, start out thinking that way. And when you're doing this in a way where you're not only showing your value, but you're showing that you're giving more than enough value, especially to yeah. those, those companies, it's, it's tremendous. Let's talk about some uh, distribution because this is where I think it gets interesting, especially for what you're doing. And I want to hear some specific stories of some things that are happening, but let's say the video shot, it's edited. Um, yeah. Now, you know, it's it's one thing to have great product, but if you don't have a way to distribute this out where you get the eyes on it, it's very difficult. So can you talk to us about your process now and kind of what that started with and maybe where you are now? Well, I think anyone who has tried to create any content realizes that it takes a lot more time than they might have allowed for upfront. And so if you're going to make high quality content or you're going to make content, you want to make sure that you have as much distribution on the different platforms that are available to us today, right? So for example, when I create a long form uh, YouTube tour, oftentimes I'll post it on Facebook and share it. I'll just share it there on my personal account. Um, but I upload it natively to Facebook. Then I also upload it natively to LinkedIn. But when I'm on LinkedIn, the write-up that I would have given on Facebook, I don't use on LinkedIn because it's a different audience. So on LinkedIn, I'm talking to the entrepreneur. I'm talking to the marketer. 
the person uh, that's speaking to more like business philosophy on why we do certain things. And then the video just becomes evidence of it. You know, it's a slight maybe byproduct that will find a buyer, but likely what we'll find is someone else that thinks our business is, is different or unique or worth talking about with their friends. Um, and then when it comes to YouTube, we do our long form there, but that means that when we're at the actual video shoot, we have to think about, are we able to leverage this for different platforms? And obviously short form video these days is huge. So what do we need for that? Right? Well, first off, what we might want to do is take the camera and film vertically and we'll film vertically, like a five to six second intro, like, Hey, want to see inside a $1.2 million home in Elbow Valley, just outside of Calgary, check this out. And that little four second clip now tells people, Hey, this is what the next 12 seconds of value is. People will watch that video. And we'll get, some of them will go, you know, 10,000 views. Some of them will go to quarter million views, right? Some of them will lead to us double ending that three and a half million dollar acreage like we did last year on there, right? And so those are the kind of things that we're able to, to use. So it's, it'd be foolish to not take the high quality content that takes so long to build and then chop it up into smaller bite-sized pieces, right? I think Inman, you guys are a great example of what you guys do there. You look at um, a, a lot of guys that have podcasts, they'll take these sound bites and they'll get four or five pieces of content out of it because they know it'd be way harder to start the camera, get ready, come up with something brilliant to say, and then record that 10 second clip and then do it all over again, you know, the next day. It's like, so we need to, to make good use of it. So if you've got a really cool property and it's got one or two really defining features, make multiple pieces of proper of content on that one property, but do it of just around those those features. So let's say you've got an amazing pool in the backyard with a swim up bar and like a little tiki bar or whatever it might be, right? Like do this, like, would you like this? Like ask, ask someone like, Hey, would you pay $300,000 to have this backyard uh, pool oasis in, in, you know, in your home kind of thing? Like ask a question like that. It's going to get people to say, no, I would not spend that much. Right. Or I would, right. Like get people to engage with your content by asking a a question. In some cases, you know, you can, you can get a little fun with it. Right. And, and, and almost provoke people, right. Because there's going to be people that are going to be on both sides of the issue. So if you can remember on your shoot day, I need to create a reel, a TikTok. I need to create the long form video. And then what I'd also like to do is well, wait a second. If I'm working with a site like curator, or if I myself, am going to go on and, and to do like a Facebook boosted post for an open house, wouldn't it be cooler to just actually say, hey, we got an open house coming up this Saturday at 1 p.m. till 3. There's going to be refreshments there. You can come and check out this incredible house. Here's some of the highlights. Hope to see you there. You say something like that. Now you boost that post. It's a personal invitation to someone. How likely is that going to perform better than a photo of the front of the house and an open house post and all that stuff? And it's you know, if you create that basic checklist of yourself for yourself at each shoot, you just tick them off and you don't. And the repeatable part that you talked about earlier is that you don't, you can get creative and creative is fun and it's, it's neat. But if you just create some basic sequences that you can use at each one of these shoots, you will find that you've got already the listings or there's listings in your market that are vacant or they're builder owned and they want exposure that you can use to start creating multiple pieces of content that convince everyone in your market that you are a busy, competent and value-filled realtor. And those are really, really, really key. Like I, I always tell people, if I see someone in a YouTube video wearing a lab coat, I assume he's a doctor. Right. If I see an agent walking around a $2 million home, I assume they're a luxury agent. And so, like for us, that's what we did. Like, a lot, depending on who you are or how you came across our content, you might think, oh, Brad's a luxury agent because we sell a lot of high end properties. Right. A lot of other people, when they go to our channel, they just notice the two, three, four, five hundred thousand dollar properties we sell and they like those. But so many agents make the mistake of thinking, well, if I want to be a luxury agent, so I have to be into luxury products, luxury cars. I need to be a luxury human and how I dress, look, appear, all that stuff. Uh, and that's what those people want. But what people forget is that like humans are just humans. And because they're just humans, 
wealthy people get told a lot of things that they want to be told to get their business. But what we get to do is they get to go to our channel and see the care and attention that our team gives a $300,000, $400,000 listing. And they know we're not blowing smoke. They can see what we've done for that family and the care and attention that we've given that property and that tour. And that has gotten us more high-end listings than other high-end listing videos. Yeah. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about like um, with the, you mentioned Instagram reels, I'm sure you're using stories, you're using TikTok. Yeah. Are you driving, are you having links like in the story or are you having any links going back to the full form video at all? Or is it just the, the teaser and then they just kind of know to go back to your channel? What, how are you doing that where you're? Directing? Yeah. So I, I do leave, like, I, I don't do one of those link trees in my, yeah. in my uh, Instagram account. Um, I probably should, <laughs> you know, even if you go to my YouTube channel, you'll notice it's like an old picture. Like I don't do half the stuff that people say you should do like your channel art. And I post every Monday at 6 PM and all those things. Not that you shouldn't do that because it's just that those things aren't the value for the, for the viewer. The viewer is something that's entertaining, highly energetic, makes them laugh, makes them stay. Like those are the things you should focus on. Everything else you can kind of leave, right? Because there's a million things that we could all be doing, you know, in, in our business to optimize every little dial. Um, but on on Instagram, um, I don't share the links to the full YouTube tours because once again, I'm trying to drive organic traffic to it. Um, so I'll give you an example, uh, like I'm working and I hope this doesn't sound like self-promotion at all, but I've been building a, a channel for agents called brand it like Brad. It's just, I'm, I geek out over stuff like this. So it's probably going to be not very interesting because I'll be talking about gimbals, camera equipment, creating content, scripts, leverage, all that stuff. Right. Like it's not, there's no silver bullet here. So that channel is going to be coming out in a couple of weeks. Now, before I share it with the agent population though that channel is going to be running on YouTube for a good month or so, letting YouTube find my audience. Mm -hmm. If I share it with the audience on, on Instagram or try to take, get viewers who watch my YouTube channel, also go check out my other YouTube channel. If I do that too early on, YouTube could get really confused on who my audience really is. And so I want the information that YouTube is going to provide me in the algorithm saying, oh, you know what? The people who we're showing these videos to, Brad, they're coming from searches about this topic or that topic. I want YouTube to find my audience first, and then I want to serve that audience with the content that YouTube's telling me that they want to hear, not the content that I want to make, right? And that's, that's the big challenge with us as agents is... Agents have spent a lot of money and time and energy explaining that the mechanisms or the, the, the as certain aspects of a deal, like, you know, what is a condition, you know, what's a waiver and what are, and none of that is interesting, right? But as salespeople, we all know in our gut, you don't sell the features, you sell the benefits. Um, but yet when we go to create content, we oftentimes create content around the features, so it's like, what are the benefits? What is this going to do for someone in the end? Like, what does this mean? What's the emotional connection that you can, that they can make from it? What will this look for their life if they were to take these next steps or these actions, right? And it's through those stories that you'll actually create like a sense of um, community with, with that audience. And that's something that Teal and I do really well. We don't have the same fair housing laws. So there's probably something that an American could watch on our Canadian channel and say, I don't know if you can say this is a great home for families or, <laughs> or something, right? So there might be a few things you might need to tweak for your market. Um, but the reality is it's, it's like the audience that you're trying to build on YouTube, let people go through a few hoops to find you. So if they're through Instagram and you're talking about your YouTube channel, great. Let them reach out to you and say, Hey man, send me a link or let them go on YouTube and search it up because that extra set of intentions by that user means they're likely someone who will actually consume that content and properly, you know, probably be a good viewer for your content. And so then it's not so bad to share it with them. Yeah. Right. But having someone who subscribes and never watches your content again is not really a value to you. It's good for your vanity, but it's bad for your analytics. 
Yeah. yeah, that's good. Hey, Brad, I'd love to hear. I'm sure there's some things that are happening where you're doing this and the distribution is leading to double siding some deals or maybe giving you opportunities that you didn't have when you were first starting. Is there anything recently that's happened that kind of is an example of the value of the video and what it's done for your business recently? Yeah, absolutely, Jimmy. So um, I'll, I'll try to compress the long winded story into sort of the footnotes of it. But last week, in partnership with Ferrari of Italy, we had Gucci come out, we had Ferrari come out, we had a bunch of local businesses, we had like the Hungarian consulate, the Lebanese consulate, we had three country singing acts, we had five of the Calgary Flames all come out to a 300 person open house at this gorgeous sort of Italian, like Tuscan inspired property of ours for the unveiling of the new Ferrari 296 that was just announced 60 days ago. There's only three of these cars in North America and they're on sort of like a show car tour around all these different cities because it's a three year wait for these, pro- for, these, uh, for these automobiles. So we only got this connection because we can reverse this back to a call I got about a year and a half ago from an agent or from a client that said, hey, listen, man, I've been watching your, your videos. Uh, this morning. I'm super excited about this. I've got a really cool house. It's got a pool, a water slide. We've got a pickleball court. It's about 6,000 square feet. And the agent that's selling it has only gotten us five showings in eight months. And I'm so mad at him. When you check the MLS, he doesn't even have it noted that we have a pool. Like I'm just uh, like, just so upset. So I want you to come list my house. I've already terminated with him before the call. I know you're our guy. Let's do this. So two weeks later, we shoot our video and while we're shooting, we also shoot a TikTok. We go back, we release the TikTok on Tuesday with the goal of releasing our full tour on Friday and then also being on the MLS on Friday. That TikTok overnight gets 140,000 views. It then gets a 70 year old business owner in our city who's on TikTok, who sees the video, who books a showing within an hour. Then four hours later, he books another showing. We show, show him for a second time. It's going to take a couple of days to think about it. So then on the Friday, we release it to the MLS. I send him over the full tour now. He's only seen this TikTok, seen the house in person. Now we've got this extra sales tool to show him. He watches the 15 minute video, books a third showing saying, Brad, I think I'm going to write an offer tomorrow at 1 p.m. Now in those first three hours on the market, we booked five showings. We did not do a price adjustment. It had been on the market for eight months. The only difference was the video. This is the thing that had the value. And because that video was entertaining and engaging, people started to understand the real value of this home rather than just dismissing it off of the first few pictures on the MLS, right? Now, fast forward, of course, now this guy buys the house. He's unrepresented. So this is my first six-figure commission as a real estate agent. Now he's got a $4 million property to sell. Tough property to sell, but very beautiful area. It's kind of a 70s, 80s, vintage glam look to it. We decide, let's be creative. Let's create a follow cam video of a dinner party, a cocktail party. So we recorded La Vie en Rose with a jazz singer. We had it performed on site. I invited a bunch of my friends for free who all had babysitters. We had a two and a half hour window to film us uh, basically, you know, greeting some guests into a party, following them as they go through around that going out onto the grounds at night and guests mingling, the song kind of reaches a crescendo and then the party sort of ends. But at the beginning and the ending, two Ferraris are in the driveway. And at that night, I met the events manager for a Ferrari because the owner, the business owner invited them out as a favor. Hey, bring out these Ferraris. They said, holy smokes, we just watched what you guys did. You're just doing this for a, a sale? Like just to sell a house? Like what? And like, isn't the house a little bit like dated and stuff like, and we're like, no, we just, this is cool. Like, and so once they saw the house and they saw what we were doing, he's like, we got to do some stuff together. And so we've kept in touch. They've had us down. We've done a couple of smaller little events where they would come out and do what we call tours and test drives. Now, of course they have a pretty massive uh, network of, of people, right? And that community of Ferrari owners is about 250 in Calgary. They are very passionate and all of them wanted to see the new model. We have a Tuscan inspired Italian home. That's a brand new listing that we've done awesome marketing on $7 million property. I I invite the owners. I say, come take a look at the house. We should do an event here. They're like, let's bring in the cars. So the wild thing is, is that because of that one video now, 
we are working with developers, with members of the Calgary Flames. We're working with all these owners and potentially are bringing in a sale on the $7 million property all because of that one event. There, there was a $45,000 Birkin bag bought that night in the, in the primary bedroom where Gucci had came in and showcased some of their, their bags and some of the high-end luxury products. Like the whole thing was like, I can't make sense of any of it. Other than all I know is that no one cares about Brad McCallum. No one cares about any of this stuff. Ferraris thought this is something where we can get more out of it than we give up. And this is the principle, like this is the Zig Ziglar thing. This is the Gary V thing. Give away 51% of the value and only ever ask for 49% back and you'll be amazed what happens. That's the entire concept of our, of our business model. I will often tell people we found a way to be really successful by making real estate about five times harder. Uh, but then we don't, we don't have to prospect. We get to work with people who respect us, who see us as equals and partners rather than interchangeable. And we get a lot of satisfaction because even though that's a really cool story about how you can, you know, have these, these really cool events. And if you check out my Instagram page, you'll see this was a 300 person open house. It was like, this was, you know, agents always say real estate's not like selling sunset. Well, a few of us that night were like, well, I guess maybe tonight it is like, so it's just as once it is. Uh, but in reality though, it's like all that stuff aside is really cool. The, the truth is we're probably facing a time in our market for many agents where in the last 10 years, you've seen a strong market. You've not seen a recession. You've not had to sell, do work your butt off to sell someone's home. And when you sell it for them, they're upset, they're hurt. Because it doesn't matter if you over-delivered, they're still trying to rebuild their life. They've still sold their home for less than what they bought it for. They're still in a tough spot. They're still facing uncertainty in their futures. And recessions bring on challenges for families and marriages. And we'll be facing things that it will really matter the work that we do. It's not just about us building personal brands and wealth for ourselves and all that sort of stuff. It's about the people that we are actually serving. And so at the end of the day, I think that idea of what's in it for them, that's been my passion. It's my passion through and through. There's a lot of great things that agents can do to optimize their, their content. There's a lot of people out there. Um, when I'm finally ready to share that channel, hopefully uh, some of you will come check it out. Um, but in the meantime, that's the reason why we do it. And that's the reason why I think agents can look at this shift that's happening in the market, and whether it's video, whether it's social media, YouTube, whether it's just some other part of their business, whatever it is, a lot of agents have something that makes them noteworthy and talk worthy in their, in their communities. Um, those agents are going to stand to gain a lot in their business in this coming, in this coming shift, because people are going to be looking for and really truly needing value. And so if you can display that, you're going to be just fine. Right. I love everything you do, man. I'll tell you what I tell, I, I say this very, very um, uh, with, with everything. I mean this completely. Um, I don't just love the amount of business you do. I love the way you do the business. Um, that authenticity comes through. Um, I don't think anybody um, after hearing you speak, watching your videos doesn't understand that um, you understand this as well as anybody I know that it's not even about you. It's about the product. It's about the service. And then all of that comes back in droves. Listen, if you're out there and you have a referral or that's heading to Calgary, please reach out to Brad. Also, let me just say this. If you're wondering exactly what you can do to step up your video game, to do it in a distribution way, check out TikTok, check out Facebook, check out Instagram with Brad. Um, also, obviously, get on YouTube, subscribe. What I love with the sub subscription and when I did it, Brad, is, is it letting me know immediately when you're doing these videos and seeing how you're evolving these things and how you're doing them differently. So just appreciate everything you're doing. Listen, Brad, thanks for everything. I know people got value out of this. If you got value out of this, reach out, let Brad know, and we'll talk to you guys soon. All right, if you've made it to the end of all four of these interviews, then you've got a ton of information and some great strategies that you can apply in your business. Now, what I would encourage you to do is to take your top two or three of those things, take action on them, apply them in your business, and I know your business will begin to grow. I hope this has been helpful, and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for watching the video. I specifically chose the video below for you because it builds on the one you just watched. I hope it's helpful, and I'll talk to you soon.